Bibles, and um, we've got just two passages that, uh, that we're going to be looking at today. Um, the first is in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 25. So you can turn there and then put your finger in the other passage. I'm going to read the Luke passage, and, uh, and then a little bit we're going to go to Philippians 2. But um, this is a passage where Jesus is making a call to discipleship. <clears throat> Peter had just confessed Jesus as being the Messiah, the Son of God. He got that by revelation. And uh, right after that, Jesus uh, makes this, this invitation, this call. And in course, in Luke 10, we have the Jesus sending out the 12 uh, disciples on their first mission. So that's kind of the context within the book of Luke. So Jesus says in verse 23, he said to them, uh, he, then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father, and of the holy angels. This is a very familiar passage. Um, We've probably heard it before. You've probably heard many messages on it. Um, and, And I think it's a really pivotal passage because at this point, Jesus is making his first call to his disciples, really honing down. Now we know that for his church, You know, at the very end of the gospel, just before he ascended into heaven, Jesus gave a mission to his church. And the mission is very simply this. Go make disciples. And uh, he says, as you go about your daily life, as you go to work, as you shop, as as you are interacting with your family, with your friends, as you go about your daily life, make disciples. Out of all people. And, uh, and, you know, that is the mission that God has given us. It is meant to be the priority of who we are as a church. Now, last week, um, our daughter Hannah and her husband Jake shared about how they are making disciples in Nottingham. Um, they are doing something called missional communities where they are looking to penetrate into communities to find people of peace, to, um, you know, in the normal course of of their life uh, to try to influence people and see where God's working. And, and th- they've got a unique ministry in, in Nottingham. And, and they shared it with us, and I wanted them to share it with us to encourage us. But their bottom line is they're making disciples. Their goal is to make disciples of other people, uh, some people who are far from Christ and who are drawn uh, to put their trust in Jesus. And the same thing is true with us, um, that that we're called to make disciples, we're going to do it differently than them. I'm not saying that the way they do it is exactly the way we're to do it here. Different context, different culture. They're in the midst of a city. We're more suburban, rural, rural area. So it's going to look differently. But the same, it's the same in the sense that we are called to influence other people's lives so that they could hear and understand the good news of Jesus. Do you know that everyone's being discipled by someone into something. Think about it. If you spend all day, every day, watching soap operas, what are you being discipled into? Depression, (laughs) discouragement. (laughs) You know, if you spend... You know, your time listening to someone or to something, um, you're being discipled by what you hear. 
A disciple is simply someone who learns. And when you look at discipleship, it goes right down to worldview. How is your worldview being shaped? How do you see the world around you? What is your idea about who God is? What is truth? Who, who I am? What are we called to be and do? That's worldview. And everyone's being discipled. Oftentimes, discipleship happens in our culture haphazardly. We're being discipled by a variety of worldviews, depending on what we watch. And, um, and everyone's discipling someone. Do you know that you're discipling people? Without even knowing it. How you live your life. The truth that you tell. When you raise children, you're discipling them. Well, I didn't want to disciple that. Well, it doesn't matter. You are discipling them into something because they watch your lives. People are watching your lives. And if they know that you're a Christian, they're seeing Christ through you. The question is, what part of Christ are they seeing? And how clearly are they seeing it? So when we talk about discipleship or becoming a disciple of Jesus, it's all about what are we going to allow to influence our thinking and our lives and our behavior and our patterns of living. And Jesus calls us first to be disciples before we can make disciples. We can't make anyone into anything we're not. Now, Imagine this. Let's say I know nothing about investment in financial markets. But I stand up here and say, my new tent making ministry is now financial investment and who wants to give me their retirement money so I can invest it for them? <laughs> you would be foolish to do that, wouldn't you? No, people aren't going to say, let me give it to you. You don't know what you're doing. And but if I was discipled in that whole industry and I was trained to understand how to do proper investments and so forth and I had a track record of success, then I would have people who would be willing to entrust their life savings with me. You follow me? saying? The purpose of discipleship is to learn to live in the pattern of Jesus so that we can say what Paul said. Follow me as I follow Christ. And I want to talk about today, just, I'm going to spend a long time, I want to talk a little bit about the call to follow Jesus. Because we're called to be disciples. We are disciples by the nature of simply being saved. But I'm talking about an intentional call that Jesus gave and that Paul reinforced in Philippians 2. Now, in, in the passage we read in Luke chapter 9, Jesus calls people to follow him. And we have to respond to that call. He was very intentional. He said, if anyone would come after me, now that's code in Jesus' day for a rabbi calling disciples to himself. If anyone would come after me, there are certain things that he has to do. Um, the fact that he said, if anyone would come after me. Usually in Jesus' day, rabbis would choose their disciples. They would say, I'll choose you. No, I don't want you. I'll choose you, and I'll choose you. Jesus turned it around. He says, anyone who wants to choose me can be my disciple. He didn't do the choosing. He allows us to self-select in. And so Jesus said, if anyone wants to be my disciple... The invitation was given. It wasn't given just to the 12 who are listening or perhaps to those beyond the 12 who are there. It was given to every person, every nation, down through the ages, anyone who would hear the call and who has a desire, they can choose Jesus. That's the gospel. We can come to the Lord. And he said, if anyone wants me to my disciple, then these are the conditions. He must Deny himself, take up the cross, follow me, and give your life for God's purposes. Those are four things. If anyone wants to follow Jesus, we know we have to deny ourselves. Now, that's not good news. Most people don't want to 
deny anything. And then we go, okay, Lord, I want to be your disciple. I'll give up chocolate for you. That's not what he's talking about. <laughs> oh, I, I'll be, I, you know, I'm going to give up comfort. I'm going to sleep with a window open when it's minus 12 degrees, and I'm going to be a disciple for Jesus. No, 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 that's not what he's talking about. It's not asceticism. It's not punishing ourselves. But it means that we are to deny the things that we would choose before Jesus. Put it this way. Denying yourself is saying no to your will so that you can say yes to God. Denying yourself is to say no to every obstacle that stands between you and saying yes to God. So what are the obstacles that stand in the way to saying yes to God? Those are the very things that you need to deny. You know, when Jesus spoke to the rich young ruler, and he said, I want to follow you, Lord. What must I do? Well, Jesus discerned that he had one obstacle that stood between him and following Jesus. And for in his life, it was his riches. Go and sell everything you have. Come follow me. He didn't want to deny himself. For us, it could be a variety of things. What is that one thing? What are those things that stand between you and saying yes to all God has for you? Saying yes to yielding your life to him. Jesus says that's the first step of a disciple. If a disciple is not willing to come and be trained and taught by the master, by the rabbi, willing to yield their will in order to learn a new way of living, a new way of life under the kingdom of God, then he can't be his disciple. And when we come to Jesus, we talk about I surrender all, as we sang today. And that's what we're saying. Lord, I am willing to deny myself. And it's self-denial with a purpose. The purpose is to be used by God, to be trained to walk in the way of Jesus. And then we had to take up our cross. Now, there's been a lot of misteaching on this. First of all, your cross is not your mean boss. Your cross is not a difficult person in your life you have to get along with. Your cross is not an illness. It's not a bad circumstance. It's not, you know, something that just went wrong. That is not our cross. A lot of times it's taught that way. I got my cross to bear. Well, no. And they say your cross is something you die on. That's true. We already dealt with self-denial. What was the cross for Jesus? What was the one reason Jesus had for coming into the world? He was born in order to give himself as a sacrifice, as a ransom for many. He went to the cross because the cross was his mission. And so when Jesus is saying to his disciples, my mission is the cross. He had just got done saying that. He said, yes, I am the Messiah, but I'm going to give my life. I'm going to be falsely accused by the, uh, you know, by the elders in the city, and I am going to give myself to the cross. That's my mission. He said, if anyone wants to be my disciple, they need to say no to their will, yes to God, and they need to take up their mission Daily. Daily. Now, if your cross is your mean boss, you don't work on Saturdays and Sundays, does that mean you can't take up your cross on the weekends? No, it's our mission. It's the purpose that God has for us. It's, it's discovering um, his call and, and working uh, that out. The whole reason that I am placed here, and that we're placed here, is to do the Father's will. And so to pick up our cross means that we are going to do our mission. We are going to do our purpose. We are going to do our will. We're going to do God's. And then he said, third thing, follow me. Now I thought about that. He says, well, he already said that. If you want to come after me, then he says, follow me. You know, that third thing is obey. Do it. Like the Nike slogan, just do it. 
If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, it's very simply this. We say no to our rights. No to the things in our life that we say, I deserve this. We say yes to the Lord and we yield ourselves to him. We say yes to his purpose, why I was created, and I discover that. And then I follow him. I live in the pattern of Jesus' life. I seek to become more like him in my attitudes, and I seek to become more like him in my actions. And there are going to be some things that he's not going to allow us to do, like defend ourselves sometimes. Sometimes we're going to suffer injustice for the sake of the gospel. And if he says, be silent, Jesus was silent before his accusers. There are going to be some things that he's going to call us into that are going to be filled with joy as we see lives around us transformed, as, as God uses us for his purposes, whatever that is. And, um, and then he says, anyone who would seek to um, lo- find his, save his life will lose it, but anyone who loses his life for my sake will find it. You know, when we give ourselves to a purpose greater than ourselves, we discover that there is a joy in living beyond self-centeredness. And we live in a country right now that is so focused on self-centered living that, uh, but that anyone who is willing to give themselves to a greater purpose um, will stand out. And Jesus says, those are the conditions. That's the call to discipleship. And when we do that, God begins to teach us and instruct us. Now, many of us have already been walking in some of that because we've learned things. But the call to discipleship needs to be intentional. It needs to be intentional for young Christians as well as people who have been in the Lord for years and years and years. Because when it's intentional, we begin to see things we didn't see before. And, um, and then we can allow God to begin to change the way we live and the way we think to come into conformity with the things that he's got for us. Let's look at Philippians chapter 2. And uh, I'm going to read through this and just comment a couple of things in this chapter. I'm not going to hit it all. And then I, I want to share a story of someone who was willing to put this into practice in their lives. So Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 12. Paul writes, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I have not run or labored for nothing. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. It's interesting. Paul is in prison and he's writing to the church of Philippi an encouraging letter, thanking them for their gift and support of his ministry while he's in prison in Rome. And then he says, you know, In verse 12, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What does he mean by that? I thought we were saved by grace. I thought Jesus already worked it out. He's not talking about, you know, the works that justify our salvation. But he's saying, if we've been saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, continue to let that salvation work its way, permeate uh, its way into every area of your life. You know, there are Christians who have been saved by grace. They're destined for heaven. They're going to spend eternity in heaven. But right here and now, they live like hell. Their lives don't match their testimony. And, uh, you know, we know people like that. 
no one in this room. We know people like that. Because somehow they think salvation only deals with the future. It only deals with going to heaven. And it doesn't matter what happens between now and then. But it does. Paul says this working out of our salvation is to allow the grace of Jesus that has been given to us to empower the way we live so that we become like Jesus in our attitudes and our actions. That the patterns of how we live our lives are changed. That, that, that we can shine forth, as he says, you know, we're like stars shining in a dark sky. When you go out at night, and I, I appreciate Wayne's photographs of the stars, when the moon's not shining and you look up at the sky, you can see all these stars shining. And, and you know, even a, a candle lit in a large stadium that's totally black, you light one candle, that candle can be seen from every part of that stadium. Because a light shining in darkness can be seen. We live in a dark world. We live in a culture that's growing darker every single day. And I go, praise God, because we have an opportunity to let the light of Jesus Christ shine through us. But we need to be working out that salvation. That is, that's the process of discipleship that Paul's talking about of becoming like Jesus, being very intentional about how we live our lives. He says, it is God who is working in you. So where is God working in your life? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, taking it seriously. For it is God who is working in you and in me. You know where God's working in your life? Ask him, he'll tell you. And that work of God that he's working is to bring you and me to a place that we desire to do his will and to embrace the, the, his good purposes for us. He doesn't work to do our will, he works to do his will. He gives us a desire to follow him and to do his will, to act according to God's good purpose. That's our mission. So as disciples, we come to Jesus and we say, Lord, I yield my life to you. Here I am, take me. Not just for an hour and a half on Sunday morning, but take me tomorrow, Monday. Take me on Tuesday and on Wednesday. Take me when I have to make the, the phone calls and deal with difficult people uh, about web services. Take me when I, when I go to the hospital and I, and I have to you know, do translations and, and I'm, I'm working with people and I may be tired, but Lord, take me. Let me shine like a light in a dark place that people would see the character of Jesus in me, that people would be able to hear the voice of Jesus when I speak. Because he says, we not only shine like lights in dark places, but we, um, um, we hold out the word of life. We bring a message of hope, a message of salvation. It's not a sales pitch. It's truth. And when we say that truth and people respond to it, then we found a person of peace. That is the call to discipleship. We recognize where God is working in us. We recognize where God is working in other people. We respond to that call of God. And then we are willing, as Paul said, to be poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice. That's sacrificial service. That's discipleship. And you know what? It is a great journey. It really is. When you think about what God can do, through a group of people who are willing to embrace that. Let me share with you a story. It's in a book by Mark Green called um, Fruitfulness on the Front Line. And every one of us has a front line, has a place where we get to minister for Jesus. And I want you to listen to this story about a man named Peter and what he did. It says, after living for 25 years in the same place, Peter retired and moved to a town where he didn't know anyone. 
He didn't have any obvious front line, though there were a lot of things Peter could do, including preaching and teaching and counseling. He prayed and asked God, what do you want me to do? Okay, so he's yielding to the Lord. It was a brave prayer and a humble one. You may not get the answer you like. For Peter, the Lord brought Jeremiah 29.7 to mind. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. And Peter wondered, how can I bless the town God brought me to? So he prayed again. And the Lord told him to pick up litter. It reminded him of Jesus washing the disciples' feet in the upper room, cleaning off the dirt. So he went to the council and asked them for a litter-picking claw, and they gave him one on permanent loan. And so it came to pass that on the days when Peter went on his two-mile walk to, through, and from the nature reserve close to his home, he'd pray and praise God for his world and pick up the litter that marred it and put it in a plastic bag. And he'd smile at people as he passed on the path and say hello. Pretty soon people started to say hello back and little conversations began. And the months passed and the people would ask, why do you do it? Because God loves the world he has made. Or they would inquire, are you being paid? He, he hasn't been, of course. And one person said, that's a thankless job. You'll get to heaven for that. So Peter replied that he hoped to get to heaven, not because he picked up litter, but because he knew Jesus who gave his life for him. During Easter week, he'd said hello to people he normally says hello to and gives them a gift, a little cross uh, made, he tells them, from olive wood from Israel where Jesus lived. A gift to remind us that Easter, at Easter, Jesus died and rose again. And some people have intended to come, uh, I'm sorry, and some people have indeed come to evangelistic meetings at the church. So as he walks, Peter the litter picker uh, picks up litter, and drivers he doesn't know toot their horns and wave in respect and gratitude. And then on one ordinary day, like any other ordinary day, a white van pulls up beside him. The window rolls down, and the man in the white van, who had, of course, somewhere to go and work to do, says, thank you very much. Well, I wondered what strikes you about that story, and what ways, in what ways has Peter been fruitful on his front line? Peter modeled the char- godly character, displaying kindness, and no doubt some self-control and patience as he picks up litter that is the result of other people's lack of self-control and patience and selflessness. He, had made, he has made good work cleaning up the park. He has taken the initiative to minister to strangers with grace and love. He has molded the culture of the walking community in the nature reserve. It's a friendlier place. He has been a mouthpiece for truth about God's concern for creation and for the right ways of stewarding it. And Peter has been a messenger of the gospel telling others about why he does what he does about his own relationship with Jesus and inviting people to find out more in a church context. That is an example, that's a true example, by the way, of someone who is willing to to yield his life, surrender himself to the Lord and say, Lord, where are you working? What do you want me to do? We can all do that. We can all respond to the call to follow Jesus, to be his disciple to let him mold us more and more into his image, to be willing to listen, to go to the places he wants us to go, to do the things, even if it's simply picking up litter, in order to serve, that others might hear and see the good news. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you Thank you for calling us and inviting us to be a part of what you're doing in our world. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us faith to not only trust you with something bigger than ourselves, but faith, Lord, to allow our imagination and our spiritual eyesight to see beyond the borders of what we currently see. Show us the people of peace that you have placed in our lives. Show us the areas, Lord, where we can um, engage our frontline ministry and be involved with the things that you are doing in our community. So, Lord, we trust you. 
and we give ourselves to you and we respond yes to your call for discipleship. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me just for our benediction? And it's taken from Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. And, um, you know, we are discipled by what we look at and by who we give ourselves to. And Paul says in verse 8, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And the peace of God will be with you. God bless you. Have a great day. And uh, let's say hi to one another before.